The most important thing is that you're always moving the project forward and so that you're always getting to the close. Remember though, that you have to get the language out of your mouth because most people won't make a decision to hire you until you ask them. I always say invite them, but it's the same thing. Ask that question and get the answer. And the answer is going to be yes, nine out of 10 times. Today, we welcome back Nikki Rausch as we talk about converting that discovery call. Have you hit a wall when it comes to growing your business? Then welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast, helping home professionals and luxury brands accelerate their success with proven marketing strategies and expert industry practices. Now, here's your host, Darla Powell. Hey there, and welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. I am your host, Darla Jethro Powell, the Grand High Poobah of all things Wingnut. And damn, it feels good to be back. (laughs) Did you miss me at all? Did you even notice I was gone? Well, I sure as hell missed you guys. I took a month off from podcasting. I needed a couple of minutes to just kind of sit back and reflect and to look at my life and see what was going on and make some hard decisions in my life. So 2020, as we all know, and I'm not unique here, was a bitch for a lot of people. Me, personally, going through a divorce, going through some restructuring due to that divorce. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's all good. It's all amicable. It's just complicated. When you're married for 10 years, have a house and kids and dogs and two businesses, it can get a little complicated. And one of the biggest things that I realized is that I am a carbon-based life form with only 24 hours a day on this planet. So I only have so much time to do all the things. And I had to really sit and get introspective and say, Darla Jethro Powell, what is it that brings you the joy in the world? So it took me a minute. It took me a little bit of time to decide You know, if someone put a gun to my head and said, you can only do Wingnut Social or you can only do Darla Powell Interiors, I was always going to Wingnut Social. So I have decided to full-time, 100% devote all of my energies into the Wingnut Social Empire. Because in the immortal words of Marie Kondo, that for me is what sparks joy. This podcast is my favorite thing on earth to do, talking to interior designers, making new friends, working at the marketing agency, Wingnut Social. I love it. It fulfills me more than anything. Who would have thunk four years ago when I started this journey that my life would have taken this course and led me to Wingnut Social and really just enjoying this whole deal over the interior design stuff, but that is where my heart lies and that is where my heart is going. So thank you guys so much for being patient, for waiting uh, somewhat five, six weeks for new episodes to come out. But here we are today with no less than the stellar Nikki Roush on the show. But first, before we get into our interview with Nikki Roush, we have a new sponsor on the Wingnut Social Podcast. Yes, we do. We have the amazing Desi Creswell as a new sponsor for the show. And you may remember Desi's episode, episode number 172 on the Wingnut Social Podcast, talking all about mindset. It was a terrific episode, very well reviewed. But now she is back. She has some exciting things coming, some really amazing courses in Upper Sleeve that we're going to tell you all about. And if you need help with your interior design business, and you need a coach, DesiCreswell.com is the one to go to. And Desi has this wonderful planner called the Designers Get It Done Daily Planner. You guys can hit that up over at desicreswell.com forward slash daily planner. It's going to increase your productivity and your mindset to new limits, new heights. What am I trying to say here? (laughs) To new amazingness. So welcome aboard, Desi. We're thrilled to have you as a sponsor on the Wingnut Social Podcast. Desi Creswell, interior design, life and business coach for you guys. And here's a little wingnut social tidbit of excitement that I am really, really fired up about announcing wingnut social premium. What is wingnut premium, you ask? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Basically, it's a members only weekly 
bonus episodes of the Wingnut Social podcast with actionable content and cheat sheets, quote unquote, for your reference. You don't even have to take notes. You can just click on the little link in the show and have your little worksheet done for you. You get monthly Instagram content planning calendars and you have access to me personally with the Ask Me Anything feature and have a chance to get your answers to your questions, your burning yearning questions read by me, yours truly, Darla Jethro Powell, on the air on these special bonus episodes. Now, this is members only. This is not one of the free weekly Wednesday episodes that you guys have grown to listen to and hopefully love. (laughs) I hope you love the episodes. Those are not going anywhere. Those are still hanging around on the Wednesdays, still chock full with amazing guests and information. But the premium subscription is just a little bit more of a deeper dive. The material's a little bit more in depth, kind of like an audio webinar masterclass series with deeper dives to help you with marketing information and some of the more technical aspects some of the answers to questions that you would pay for. You know what I mean? So that's why it is a paid service. It is $14.95 a month. You can't beat that with a stick. For the four bonus episodes, only for members, the monthly Instagram content planning calendar, and the Ask Me Anything. Have direct access to Darla Jethro Powell. So go and check that out. That's going to be at wingnutsocial.supercast.tech, or you can go to wingnutsocial.com to any of the podcast pages and hit up the link there. We look forward to seeing you at Wingnut Premium. All right. That was a lot to catch up on. That's what happens when you take a month off, right? Today's guest, again, Nikki Roush. We're going to talk about closing those discovery calls. But first, (laughs) it's time for Mini News Sesh. Mini News Sesh. It's time for Mini News. Mini News Sesh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is going to be brief, but I just wanted to let you guys know in the Mini News Sesh that Facebook Analytics is closing its doors on June 30th and people are up in arms. It's not a huge deal. It's more of a deal for marketers or people who are really closely following their analytics in just one easy to find spot, the Facebook analytics page, but um, they're shuttering down. I don't know why. I think it's because not too many people are really availing themselves of it. What struck me about this was because Facebook owns Instagram, is Instagram going to follow suit? So, hmm. No, no, that remains to be seen. But we have three months. As marketers, we have three months to figure out another avenue to get in there and to get your stats for your Facebook posts, for your ads, and how they're performing. But truthfully, on the marketing side, we weren't really using Facebook analytics a whole hell of a lot. So Facebook is closing down Facebook analytics. They still have the business suite. They still have ads managers. They still have the events manager. I think this is just a reaction to people getting fed up with being tracked by Facebook and by Instagram. So this is something, a trend that we might be seeing, but you know, there's always workarounds for that kind of thing to get your stats. So you guys are going to be able to get some of the same stats if you use a combination of the Facebook services, such as Facebook Business Suite, Ads Manager, or the Events Manager. You might have to mix and match and kind of combine your stats there. But I will say this about the Facebook Business Suite. Right now, it's limited to only small businesses, which we all kind of are. But it could be a limitation. So they probably are planning on opening that up. In fact, Facebook did state that it intended for the Facebook business suite to be available to all businesses in 2021. They just haven't said exactly when. So don't go crazy. Doesn't mean anything earth shattering. It just is what it is. It's the sign of the times. The only thing constant in social media marketing is change. Facebook analytics, no more as of June 30th. Many new sesh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me tell you about today's guest, Nikki Rausch. Not only was Nikki a previous guest on episode 97 of the Wingnut Social Podcast, another amazing episode on sales, but she is the CEO of Sales Maven, an organization dedicated to authentic selling. Nikki Rausch has the unique ability to transform the misunderstood process of selling. With 25 years of experience selling to such prestigious organizations as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Hewlett Packard, and NASA, Nikki shattered sales records in many industries, receiving multiple top producer awards along the way. Today, entrepreneurs and small business owners from a wide range of disciplines hire Nikki to show them how to sell successfully and authentically without being pushy or salesy. My God, how important is that? An engaging and sought-after speaker, she shares the secrets of her sales success through illuminating keynote addresses and business-changing workshops. 
her robust sales maven society ignites game-changing outcomes for clients. Nikki's three popular books are available at Amazon, and her podcast, Sales Maven, can be found on your favorite podcast platform, Wingnuts. Help me in welcoming Nikki Rausch to the Wingnut Social Podcast. Hey there, Nikki Rausch. Welcome back to the podcast. How the hell are you? I am fantastic. Thanks for having me back. I'm super flattered, and I can't believe how long it's been, how many podcast episodes you've done since. I'm in awe, and I'm like bowing down to you. Well, even more importantly, how many podcast episodes have you done? Congrats on your podcast launch of the Sales Maven podcast, correct? Yes, thank you so much. I just went and like hit the one year mark, which feels significant. Holy cow. Has it been that long since you've been on the show? Episode 97, where this is 212. I guess it has. Man, time flies when you're on COVID. (laughs) 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 The first episode was extraordinarily helpful, not just for myself personally, for sales, for my interior design firm and overcoming some of that sales mindset. But for the audience as well, we got tremendous amount of feedback on how helpful your episode was. So today you came to me with an excellent idea that I thought could help a lot of people because where do all the sales, you know, meetings for interior designers start? And that's usually on the phone call or even nowadays with COVID, that initial Zoom call. So we're going to be talking about how to convert those discovery calls into real life paying clients. But I'm imagining, and you tell me if I'm wrong anywhere here, that we want to convert the qualified ideal clients as well. So part of that would be the filtering out, I'm guessing, right? You're the expert. Yeah, absolutely. The objective during discovery call is to identify, am I talking to a potential client? If not, How can I wrap this up in a way that's kind, credible, and leaves them feeling really good about the interaction and doesn't take too much of my time? And for the ideal people, how can I ask the right questions and move them to the next step in the process with me? For me, the discovery call is, it's that crucial moment to identify, like, am I actually talking to a legit potential client here? Or am I just talking to somebody who... I don't know if this ever happens in the design world. I get this sometimes that people want to tell me how much they know about sales. And then I think, okay, thank you for calling to tell me how much you know about sales and I'll validate for you how much you know about sales and I'll kindly bless and release you. (laughs) Oh, the bless and release. Yes, I remember that. Do you think that's because they want to kind of show you that they know a little bit about sales because traditionally sales has been kind of Um, I don't want to say smarmy, but, you know, people get on their defensive with salespeople. So we're teaching away from that, right? The sales isn't smarmy or sleazy or greasy anymore. It doesn't have to be. No, it doesn't have to be. And as a matter of fact, it shouldn't be. I always say now, sales is something you do with somebody, not to somebody. And if you're approaching sales like, I'm doing this to somebody, that feels gross. That feels awkward and weird. It feels a little predatory. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, a little manipulative, a little aggressive. Yeah. You're going to show up on Dateline. Who's like, guys are going to be standing there saying, hey, can you mind talking to the camera for (laughs) 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 Was it Phil Hansen or whatever his name? Chris Hansen. That's who it was on. Yeah. (laughs) To catch a predator, to catch a sales predator. We don't want to be on that show. Okay. So let's start from the the beginning. Then you get a sales call. They call up Darla Powell Interiors. I'm interested in some design. And I tell you what, to parallel what you just said. They love to tell us all about, all about, they love to unload on their design and how much they love design and like to watch HGTV and all that. Anyway, just an aside. What's some of the first things that we should be saying when that phone call comes in to just kind of develop that rapport and to kind of start that filter? Where is this client? Where am I referring them or what's the next steps? The very first thing you want to do is pre-frame. And I'll give you an example of a pre-frame. And the importance behind the pre-frame is to one, create safety and also to establish the flow of the call. Um, When I say create safety, one of the things I think sometimes people forget is that, you know, you're really excited as the interior designer to be talking to a new prospective client potentially. And maybe you know something about their project or you know something about them. And there's this part of you that's like, oh my gosh, I would love, love, love this project. So you show up with a little bit of this anticipation, this little bit of nerves. And what we sometimes forget is the prospective client may feel a little nervous about talking to you. They may, one, feel intimidated about your expertise. Two, they might feel like maybe 
you know, this person, I'm going to sound stupid to them because they know a bunch of things I don't know, or maybe they're going to think that I'm not an ideal client for them. So we want to calm those waters as much as possible. And a preframe helps do that. So the objective of the preframe is to, again, establish the kind of flow of the meeting. So an example of a preframe would be, thank you so much for taking this time to chat with us today or chat with me today. The objective of this meeting is to find out a little bit more about your project and see if we are a good fit for possibly working together. We're scheduled to chat for about and then say amount of time. This is crucial because if they only have 10 minutes and you want to talk to them for 20, or if you think you're going to talk to them for 20 and they're like, oh, really? Because I need two hours with you. Like we want to establish that right off the bat. Like we're scheduled to chat for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever that is. Does that still work in your schedule? So get the yes from them. And then you say, now in order to make this meeting meaningful and productive for you, I'd like to start with a couple quick questions. Is that all right? And by doing that, now you can take the lead and start asking some questions to identify, am I talking to an ideal client? Or am I talking to a tire kicker? Or am I talking to somebody who is, you know, looking for free advice? Now, let me ask you a question, Nikki. Is this something that, is this a process that you would follow from someone just cold calling into the, your design firm, you're answering the phone, Darla Palantir, is this is Darla, how can I help you? Or is this something like you're, you've set the appointment? Is there a different structure for cold leads coming yeah, in? Yeah, a little different. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's such a good question. You're so smart. I love that <laughs> question so much. Okay. So if they're calling into you and you're answering the phone, you still are going to do a little bit of a pre-frame because chances are they're calling in, they've got a question, right? Mm -hmm. So when somebody calls in and they have a question, your job is to answer the question and then steer the meeting. So if somebody calls in and says, hey, I'm looking for an interior designer and I'm wondering, do you have availability in the next six months to take on a kitchen redesign? Your answer is going to be, Yes. Mm -hmm. Hopefully your answer is like, (laughs) yes, unless maybe it's a no. Or maybe not. Uh, Yes. We absolutely have the opportunity to take on a project in the next six months. Now, is it okay if I start by asking you a couple quick questions about your project and see if we're a good fit for you? So now I just (laughs) pre-framed a little bit like, hey, I'm going to ask you some questions, but I'm going to ask permission first. I'm not going to say, well, it depends I need to find out more information first because Ooh. that sounds a little combative. Guilty. I've done that. I have done that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on whether or not I like you. <laughs> yes. Which could absolutely be true, but let's not say that to the prospect. <laughs> I know, right? There's a filter. So I like that. So it's basically, I just gave like, like a funnel there for one incoming call and one for setting an appointment. So would you always, if it's on an incoming call, you always just kind of if you've asked the permission, they start talking to you and saying, yeah, sure, let's let's do the do. Go ahead and take it there if you have the time. If you have the time. Okay, okay. Yeah, if you have the time, you want to get it in the moment because that's when it's okay. hot. That's okay. like, you know, you're at the peak of their interest and they've got some time because they've taken the time to call you. So now they might be surprised that you answered your phone, frankly. They might be like, oh, I was expecting to leave a message. You answered, no, I actually have a meeting in five minutes. So you could check and see. You could say, now, do you have a few minutes now to chat about this? Okay. And ask them. And then, great, let me start with a couple quick questions. Okay. So let's say we're at that next point then. Which questions are we starting to ask them to vet them? And we're going to get into, you had mentioned to me that we're giving away a lot of free advice on these calls. And we're going to talk about not doing that. So what kind of questions are we asking to lead into the meet? So I like to ask questions that I only need the answers to in order to earn their business. And what I mean by that is, and I found this because I have worked with quite a few interior designers as clients, I find that a lot of times in that discovery, they want to ask all the questions that they need the answers to after they've earned the business and after they've signed the contract to move forward, because they think that's going to save them time. But I think that kind of muddies the waters a little bit in the conversation. So we want to ask the questions that we really need the answers to, to identify, is this an ideal client or not? Okay. And save those questions like, what's your aesthetic? 
Okay. I, I think that is a question that comes after you guys have agreed in some way to move forward together. Okay. Unless you disagree, because if you really need to know what their aesthetic mm-hmm. is or what their color scheme is or what year their house was built, mm-hmm. I think those questions come later after we've gone through that initial. Well, there are some designers who will only work with some aesthetic. And if you're in the audience and that is you and you're only going to do, you know, shiplap design, then maybe that's a question you want to ask. But if you're a designer who wants the business and you can do any kind of design, I 100% think that's a a terrific idea. And I like that you said not to muddy up the waters because it does, right? When you start getting watered down and you lose focus. Yeah. And by asking somebody a lot of questions, (laughs) it can sometimes overwhelm them and make them go like, maybe I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should wait. Yeah. We just want to get enough information to know, like, is this an ideal client or not? So I would say just to give for people who like really specifics, my suggestion is in that initial conversation, you probably are not going to ask more than 15 questions. And I would probably try to tailor it to, to be about somewhere between seven and 10 if you can. So don't beat yourself up if you're like, no, Nikki, I have to have 16 questions. Okay. <laughs> but if you have 30, it's too many. Give us an example of some of the really good questions that we should be asking in there. There's going to be very specific questions that are tailored to your business. So that's something that, you know, I want you to ask if you need them tailored to your business. Sure. But there's other questions like, what's important to you about your kitchen redesign? Like, and you might even say, like, what are the three most important things to you about your kitchen design? Because that is information that you're going to use back when you lay out your proposal and you're talking about how you're meeting those like important things to them. You're speaking their language. So I love the what's important to you. I always say like insert your context there. So what's important to you and then insert some context behind that question. Okay, awesome. I love that. And I find that I even use that at Wingnut. Like, And it's not a sales technique as much as it is. You're hearing the client's concerns. This is their pain points. This is what's important to you. Can I satisfy that with the service I offer? Okay, tell them how you can do it. And this is solving your pain point. It's, this gets back to the not being smarmy at sales. This is, can I provide the service they're looking for and make them happy at the end? So it's it's not tricks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really <laughs> helping people. So I, I love that What's another one? Okay. So another question that I always think is important to ask in this initial conversation is something around budget or investment. Okay. Because this is going to help you self-identify or help them self-identify. And I think I might have even talked about this a little bit on the first episode that we did together, Mm -hmm. that sometimes you have to give a range to like prep them for this. But you want to know this because, and I think I even said this on the episode where I, you don't want to be talking to somebody who's like, well, I have $500 to invest. <laughs> now, if you work for $500, great. But as an interior designer, I suspect there's very few listeners that are going to go, that's me. That's just a consultation. <laughs> yes, <of laughs> basically. Course. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I can come in and give you some ideas on my consultation and say goodbye at the end of the day. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. Thank you so much. I wish you the best of luck with your kitchen. <laughs> okay, so I think we did touch about just a little bit on, on episode 97, your first appearance. So we won't go in it too in detail. But I have found, and I'm sure I mentioned this on the first one, that that is the hardest thing to pull out of clients for interior design clients. And there's two reasons for this. One, if they tell you they have a $60,000 budget for their kitchen, you're going to spend 61000 on their kitchen. You know, they're afraid mm-hmm. to tell you they have an entire budget because they think you're going to adjust your prices just to fill that regardless of what they need or, or the design. And the second one is ignorance. They really just have no idea or they watch too much HGTV. So you're saying give them a range. Like for, in my experience in Miami, uh, kitchens can run you anywhere from 40000 on the low end to as much as $150,000. Did you have an idea about where your comfort level was? that kind of situation? Yeah. Like where would you Mm -hmm. fall in that? You know, where are you guys looking to, you know, kind of stay within or do you have a Mm -hmm. budget like that? And then you wait, like don't fill in a bunch of words after that. Like you ask the question and then you zip it. Like you wait and let them answer, give them some time to process. Even if there's a part of them, they're like, well, and they're starting to look at each other if it's a (laughs) husband and wife team. And they're like, "Eh, do we say, do we not say? They're much more likely to say if you give them just a little bit of time to answer the question. And frankly, you really kind of need that answer. Now, there's maybe some businesses out there, but I think in interior design, 
you know, my impression is that you do need some type of an answer from them. Now, if they're like, we have no idea, but we're not worried about money. Okay, great. Move on (laughs) in the conversation. (laughs) Like, how great is that? Yeah. And you're still going to be an integrity, right? You're still only going to recommend the project and the pricing that fits for what you're actually doing, right? You're Unless, I don't know, I'm not a big fan of people that say, well, I find out how much the person makes and I charge this person $1,000 and yeah. I charge this person $10,000. Right. That feels out of integrity to me personally. Yes. So I don't like that. Absolutely. I don't recommend it. Hey, Desi Creswell, thanks for being a new sponsor on the Wingnut Social Podcast. We're so excited to have you on board. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Desi, I'm obsessed with journaling and I'm obsessed with daily planning. And I hear that you have a new Get It Done Daily Planner. Tell me about it. Why is it so amazing and why should I switch to it? Oh, it is amazing, Darla, because it actually combines the strategies of effective time management with the mindset work. So it's essentially a planner for your time combined with a journal all in one because traditional time management doesn't work because it doesn't include the mindset work. We all know how to find time management tips. We've got Google, but we need to understand why we're not doing what we say we're going to do. I love that. Tell me a little bit more about the mindset work. So it's all about understanding the thoughts that are driving how we show up in our life and business. And that's how we create sustainable lasting change. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to trade the short term comfort of scrolling through Instagram and trade that for compounding long term issues that these behaviors create. And that's why I teach my clients how to be self accountable to themselves like they would to be a client. And that's what's included in this planner. That sounds awesome, Desi. Please tell the listeners where they can go to get your daily planner www.desicresswell.com forward slash daily planner. All right. That's www.desicresswell.com forward slash daily planner. Run, don't walk to get your daily planner today. And I think that's why that's what I was getting at, where we get so much pushback, where they think that you're just adjusting for wherever it is that, you know, they are. They see more a bigger profit with this person that has a $70,000 kitchen than Maybe they only need a $35,000 kitchen where they are, you know, don't want to improve their house. Okay, so let's talk about another tree branch of this. They have said a budget that works in your range. Let's take the conversation from there. Should we spend any time talking about they said $10,000 and where do we take the conversation? Are we closing it out then? I guess we probably should address that, right? Probably you're going to need to ask a few more questions. I will give you one other like question that I love, love, love to ask And you can decide whether or not you put this into your discovery. But I love to ask somebody, what do you already know about Darla Powell interiors, right? Or you probably want to ask a little bit of a a question like that to understand where they're coming from, from a like this question realistically kind of is a multi-purpose question. The the reason I ask it one is we want to identify, do they have any inaccurate information? So we need to ask a question that allows for them to do that, like to come forward with whatever they, they think they know. The other reason I like this question is it allows them to be the expert. And I don't know if you are familiar with this, but the person who's asking the questions in the conversation tends to hold the power. And we want to balance power out in a relationship with a prospective client. So when you ask a question like this, what do you already know? Whatever their answer is, they are the expert in the moment. So it allows for them to kind of balance out that power. So it's not like you're always asking all the questions. They don't get to like be the expert at all. Um, The other thing is I love, love, love to ask a question that allows for me to reinforce anything that they say that they're right about. And the reason for this is it's a rapport builder most people like to be right. I don't know, Darla, do you like to be right? I love to be right, which doesn't happen a lot, but I still love it. (laughs) It feels really great, right? And if somebody says to you, oh my gosh, Darla, you're so right about this. And then they say, and, and they insert some other thing they want you to know, you're much more likely to want to agree and or be open to hearing it when you can reinforce this person is right. Like you're right. We do specialize in such and such. And we also have this other branch of our business that we might be able to serve you as well. I love that. So that's really developing something that's in their mind because they gave you the information. So you're piggybacking off of what they've given you. So I do see where it gives them a little bit more control and, and puts them in the driver's seat there. 
even from a subconscious level. It's like, oh, well, I made this decision. I told them this and I feel very comfortable about it. I can definitely see that. I think you could sell me anything, Nikki. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the remaining questions. Is that something that's more firm specific? It probably is more project specific. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. One other little question sure. mm-hmm. you might need to know the answers to is um, whom besides yourself is involved in the decision making process? Oh, my God. Yes. I'm writing these down. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that's so important. I can't t- tell you how many people are like, oh, what well, can you do the presentation again? My husband wasn't here and he wants to see everything. So yeah, no, let's gather everybody. All the decision makers in the same thing, right? Okay, so let's go back to, they said that it's only $10,000 for their kitchen. So have you just kind of put that on the shelf and are you still going through the motions, asking them the rest of the questions, hoping to educate them into our budget? Or what are we doing with that? Okay, so I might qualify. If somebody says... We have $10,000 total to invest in our kitchen. Mm -hmm. That might indicate, it's kind of like somebody saying to me, actually, I did have this happen one time, like, Nikki, I have $100 to invest. So I know right off the bat, like $100 to invest with the kind of work that I do from a private coaching standpoint with clients, their options are to go buy my books. (laughs) Yeah. So I might stop right there and say, you know, with a $10,000 budget, that usually doesn't allow for an interior designer to come in and actually do something for you. So I'm wondering if maybe we should focus this conversation about hiring me to do a consultation that I offer that's a one hour session or two hour session, whatever it is. And it focuses on this area Mm -hmm. of your design. And then you take what comes out of that and you go and do it on your own. Is that something you'd rather chat about? And if they're like, well, we really want to hire an interior designer, you know, to do everything, then you would say, well, an interior designer, you're usually looking at you know, something that's in this 40000 to $150,000 investment. And a percentage of that is going to go to the designer. That percent is usually around this amount. Mm-hmm. So let's say you have a $100,000 kitchen remodel. You're looking at this is the percentage that's going to go towards the interior designer. Is that something that would work for you? Right. And so what I like about that so much is that you haven't given money away. You've given them an option to still work with you. So they still are going to have warm fuzzies about you and your design firm and working with you. And maybe you've spent 10 hours or a couple of hours just doing some consulting, still getting paid your hourly rate, still building that goodwill for when they buy the next house and they can do the $100,000 kitchen. So that's perfect. Let's talk a little bit about how to stop providing free advice on the initial calls. How much is too much? Well, (laughs) I think... Almost anything can be too much. So (laughs) I always say do not coach and do not give free advice on your consultation calls if this is something that you charge for. Now, if it's not, the advice maybe isn't like I have tons of advice and a lot of it aren't necessarily things that I would charge somebody for. So I'm okay with that. But what you want to be really careful about doing is sometimes you'll give somebody this like piece of your expertise because you know, it's just this tiny little piece. And I often will relate this to like, imagine that it's like one grain of sand and behind you is this big, beautiful, like white beach with all your resources, all your expertise, all the things that you can really do for somebody. But they don't know about the resources. They don't know about this big, beautiful beach that sits behind you when they pay you money. They see this tiny little grain of sand, this tiny little piece of your expertise, which frankly for you is probably like almost a throwaway because you know so much. Yeah. But to them, they think that is the beach. Then they don't think they need to hire you. And then they don't end up getting the results that they want. They don't move forward on the project because it was just one little piece and they need all these other things to really get what it is they say they want. So you want to be really careful about coaching or giving free advice during those consultations. I love that because they don't know what they don't know. If you give them that little bit of advice, oh, she solved my problem. There's no really reason to move further when really they just have, they only just had the one little grain of sand and they need a whole damn beach. (laughs) <laughs> they need a whole beach. They need a whole beach. Although I hate it when sand gets on my blanket. I will say that. Okay. What are some examples of buying signals? You're in this conversation. You can tell they're, they're it's like, you almost had it. You're reeling them in like a big fish. What are we looking for? 
So buying signals are verbal and nonverbal cues that people give that indicate interest. And a lot of times a buying signal comes in the form of a question. Now here's a potential buying signal that you might hear in your discovery calls. They'll frame the question as if they're asking for somebody else. They might say, so if somebody were to hire you, like where would you be sourcing product? They're not asking, they don't have an invisible friend. They didn't call you for their friend. That question is related to them and it's a huge buying signal. And so asking for a friend, like <laughs> yeah. the asking for a friend, I like that because in their mind, they're thinking, okay, I want to hire them, but I don't want to like put all my cards on the table. I still want to put up a little bit of a wall of safety there and say, if someone were to hire you and not identify with a hundred percent, I love that. That is a strong buying signal. What's another? Yeah. And so when you get it, I want you to answer the question for them. Well, when we work together, I source product from here, here, and here. Your answer might actually be, when we work together, I'll go through my list of places that I source product for you. The advantage to that for you is that you know you're getting something that is handpicked for your project, specific to you, for your likes, your tastes, and you're going to get something that's quality that's going to last so that's something that we can talk about once we have moved forward with working together. I love that. That's so good. What's another example of a buying signal? This one, we'll see how you feel about this. This uh, Sometimes I get a like groan when I share this one <laughs> is a potential buying signal is somebody will want to share with you a bad experience that they had with somebody who's in the line of work that you are. Yeah. Now this can happen at a party. This could happen when you're actually in a discovery call with somebody, but oftentimes it happens when you're kind of out and about and people find out what you do for a living and they'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, we tried to work with a designer when we bought this house and it just, it was a nightmare and they, they go into the story. So when somebody brings up a negative experience, I always say, check and see if it is a buying signal because they might be wanting to share that with you because they're looking for you to reassure them in some way about how when working with you, they're going to have an experience that is more fulfilling, that's going to get them what they want, all that good stuff. So I often say when somebody does that, I'll say to them, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. You know, here's how I work with my clients mm -hmm. and tell them a little bit and then say, now, is there some way I might be a resource to you? No groans, no groans here. In fact, when you said that, the first thing that I thought about was they've hired a designer in the past. This is a behavior. They're open to doing it. They spent money on hiring a designer. So really, all you have to do is go in and just, like you said, reassure them that, sorry that that happened, but this is how I work. So you're telling them that you're going to get what you wanted hiring designer. Do it again. You're in a safe space. <laughs> no groans. I 100% agree. Nikki, is there anything that I've forgotten to ask you that you think the wingnuts need to hear that we haven't answered before we go into the what up wingnut round? The most important thing is that you're always moving the project forward and so that you're always getting to the close, right? And I do teach a five-step process for sales conversations, which is called the selling staircase. Okay. And you can't just jump from step one all the way to the close. You've got to go through the steps. Remember though, that you have to get the language out of your mouth because most people won't make a decision to hire you until you ask them. I always say invite them, but it's the same thing. So when you have laid out a proposal for somebody or once you've gotten to the end of your discovery call and you go, you know, based on what you've shared, I get a sense that this is a project that would be a good fit for my skill set and also would work for you. Are you interested in having me put together a proposal for you? Ask that question and get the answer. And the answer is going to be Yes, nine out of 10 times. Yeah, you just nailed that discovery call. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, Nikki, now I have to ask you, are you ready for the What Up Wingnut round? Yes, I'm ready. Now it's time for What Up Wingnut. Wingnut. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Well, I'm going to a new answer from my answer last time, and it's going to be blessed are the flexible. Mm, that would be a great like motivational poster in a yoga studio. <laughs> yeah. Well, the full, the full quote is, Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. That seems like a long hashtag. I like that. Well, you know, we've had some long ones on the show. Second question. You're stuck on a deserted island. You can only have one of your favorite foods. What does it go? I'm going to say my green enchiladas because it's like my comfort food. And if I'm stuck on a desert island, I'm going to need some comfort. I love that. Is that the enchiladas with like the mole sauce? I do love a mole sauce. I do too. 
this is something that my mom taught me how to make when I was a little girl. It's a family favorite and it's, it's straight up comfort food. My husband calls it hillbilly vittles because it involves <laughs> opening a can, a couple cans, but it's so delicious. It's one of his favorite things that I make too, because it's just super comforting. It's super cheesy. It's super delicious. I love it. Now you mean like actual cheese, I'm thinking, not like it's a corny recipe. Send me the recipe. We'll put it in the show notes. Honestly, I'd have to write it out because it's like a family. It's like something you teach, like uh, your I mom see. teaches you at the stove. Sure, sure. My mom doesn't follow recipes. So like when my mom's gone, we'll have no like recipes from mama. I got you. Okay. All right. Sorry, wingnuts. <laughs> You're just going to have to make up your own enchilada, green enchilada recipe. And last but not least, what is your favorite book? It can be a personal one or a professional business based one. Well, the one I'm reading right now, which I think is fantastic, is called Wonderworks. And it's called uh, The 25 Most Powerful Inventions in the History of Literature. It's by Angus Fletcher. I love story. And he's talking about how story and literature is a technology and how it's taught us as humans to do things. And it's fantastic. And he breaks it down into like how story creates curiosity, how story creates like overcoming, you know, trauma. And it's so fantastic. And what what's the title of it? Wonderworks? Or no, that's the... Wonderworks. Two words. Wonderworks. Okay, cool. Wonderworks. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. Nikki, please tell the Wingnuts where they can go to learn more information about you and tell us a little bit about that course you mentioned. I always like to give a gift. It's the same gift I gave when I was here last time. So if you've already downloaded it, you don't need it again. But if you hadn't, it's my ebook called Closing the Sale. And it's all about increasing your confidence in those discovery calls and moving people through the process, you can get it by going to my website, which is yoursalesmaven.com forward slash WNS for Wingnut Social. So WNS, super easy. Go download the book and then we'll be connected. All right. That's going to be in the show notes at wingnutsocial.com. Just look for the latest episode. Or if you're listening at a later date, just browse the episodes, look up Nikki, and you can get that free audiobook. Nikki? Is there anything else? I don't think so. That's me. I'd love to <laughs> I'd love to hear from your audience. Thank you so much for having me back. And it's just such a pleasure to spend time with you. Same here, Nikki. It's always amazing to see you. Thank you so much for being an extraordinary guest a second time on the podcast. You have an amazing week. So there was a lot of things in that conversation that I really loved. Nikki really broke down the sales call. And normally I get like... If there's a sales call coming in and it's like just cold and it wasn't on the calendar, I get a little kerfluffled. Is that a word? I get a little like off my game, off kilter. But with this as a guideline, I feel way more confident that I could just, okay, let me funnel this call. Do you have a couple of minutes? Is it okay if I ask you some questions and pre-framing and setting that safety boundaries, telling them, do you have 10 minutes? Do you have 15 minutes? Do you have 20 minutes? with the questions, you know, and what's important to you about your space? And one thing I was doing for consultations is what do you dislike about this space? What do you like about this space? But I like this, this, I like this better. What's important to you about having this project done or this kitchen? What's the most important to you in a kitchen? And and really dialing in the budget and having that branch. Okay, they have your budget. You think you might want to work with them. Things are looking good. And, or if they don't, then it's plan B, going to your consulting or going to your consultation as well with some of these questions. And if she's so right about the buying signals, asking for a friend, if we were to work with you or if some, you know, that's how she worded it. If someone were to work with you, you might as well just go ahead and cash that check. <laughs> That is a very good indicator that you're doing a stellar, stellar job on your call. And then just take some practice and being comfortable. And I'll tell you what, Nikki, you are incredibly comfortable with this. You make it look easy. So it might just take a couple calls for you to get the hang of this. And if you ever have someone coming up saying, oh, we hired a designer and it wasn't the best experience, don't roll your eyes and walk away. <laughs> it's an opportunity. That's a buying signal. They, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. That designer clearly sucks. But here's why I'm so awesome. No, don't say that. But you know what I mean. I, I kid, I kid, but I kind of don't kid. All right, guys. So that is really it for this episode. Nikki, I mean, she said it all. There's, I can't really add to what she said because she is the expert and she is the best. So I invite you to go over, listen to her podcast, Sales Maven Podcast. Go over and check out that ebook. That's a free gift for you. You guys can go to wingnutsocial.com in the show notes and that link will be right there for you. 
I'm telling you, lots of grains of sand in that to help you close your discovery calls for your interior design business. And don't forget to go and check out the Premium Wingnut Podcast. That's four episodes a month, chock full of information that you guys can get for your interior design business, for the success of that. And that is it for today. Remember, if you like what you hear, leave us a review on whatever the hell you're listening to this podcast on and go out there, get uncomfortable and be great. You've reached the end of this episode of Wingnut Social, but that's only the first step into accelerating your business the Wingnut way. Head on over to wingnutsocial.com to see how we can help you take your business from social mediocre to social media master. Hey there, and welcome. <laughs> hey there, and welcome to the Ring Super Guest. What, what happened to my audio? As I burp up my Starbucks. I'm super stoked. <laughs> Good boy, Mango.